Weddings, if you have the stomach for it, that is. If you are a guest, you definitely have. Free food. I went to my own parents' wedding inside my mother's belly, and it was the best time of my life. But I'm not here to talk about my very brief experiences with weddings. I'm Ari Thurger, and today I'm going to talk about Viking Age weddings. Well then, I occasionally get questions from couples who want to have a Viking-themed wedding. Most of these questions coming from my own patrons who are engaged and want to reconstruct a Viking Age wedding. And at this point I thought it would, I, at least I should probably make a video about it. But before that, I would like to spare a few words concerning this subject very briefly, because it is important to bear in mind a few key factors so you don't get your hopes too high, as it is important to be aware of what is truly known and what can actually be recreated and where do we have to fill in the gaps, so to speak, by either improvising or adapting certain procedures and ceremonies and even rituals from other cultural and religious backgrounds. I've noticed that some people these days have Viking weddings and the entire performance is quite curious. Uh, but I've noticed the information that led people to perform such a wedding comes from the portrayals of Viking weddings, mostly in movies and TV series, most recently from the TV series Vikings, which for some reason some have taken it to be historically accurate, but it isn't, unfortunately. I'm not by any means condemning the way people choose to perform their weddings, as I am a fervent believer and supporter in the freedom of expressing ourselves the way we want and in the way that is most meaningful to us. It's perfectly natural to create specific behaviors that are meaningful to us when there's lack of substantial information and evidences to do what we want to do in the way we wanted to do it. Concerning Viking Age weddings, sadly, we know little about it, close to nothing, I should say. There really isn't an extensive body of knowledge concerning these ceremonial performances, what type of rituals were involved, any specific religious practice, clothing, etc. There are a few speculations based on some literary sources, like invoking Thor during a wedding ceremony, and some go as far as to say the hammer of Thor was involved, which in contemporary constructions of thematic weddings among neo-pagans and modern heathens has been used to make the sign of the cross as a substitute in official wedding performances, which is kind of weird. <laughs> in some representations in pop culture, including recently in the Vikings series, the series called Vikings, the couple characters are often dressed in white robes and the bride with a wreath on her head. We often see that there are also included exchanges of rings between the bride and the groom and declarations made to each other. These scenes are, of course, inspired by the modern wedding performances. I've been told there is a wedding in the recent movie The Northman. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I will eventually. And if you insist, I shall spare a few words concerning that movie when I see it. But I'm not going to comment on that wedding. At least, not for now. Um, what we usually see in pop culture concerning pagan weddings and Viking Age weddings, for that matter, is definitely a lot of white dresses, the couple often using white, exchange of rings, some prayers, the, the presence of a sort of priest or a priestly figure conducting the wedding ceremony, etc., etc. These are, as I said, inspired by modern wedding performances. I mean, you, you literally Google Viking weddings or Viking wedding, and most images are about the complete fantasy of Floke's wedding with another character, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, from the TV series Vikings. Floke, a name that sounds like Marvel launched a shitty Loki-themed serials that taste like cardboard, but it's actually an historical name of an historical figure. Anyway, weddings are mentioned in Nordic medieval literary sources, mind you, but there are no details of any kind. We do not know what type of clothing the bride and groom wore, how long the ritual lasted, what type of ritual, whether there were exchanges of gifts, festivities, processions, or real or symbolic sexual intercourse, 
all the scenes of Viking weddings that we see in movies and TV series are totally fantasy, conjectural or products of the imagination. Modern attempts to recreate pagan weddings are also heading in the same direction. They are reinterpretations or even new modern constructions barely inspired by the past. Sometimes the inspiration is on contemporary romanticisms of a vague past and not historically or historical reconstructions. We know that weddings were important rites of passage for ancient Scandinavian societies and other societies, obviously, but unfortunately their details have been lost. I know that many attribute the loss of knowledge to the progressive uh, Christianization, but the truth is that there are other factors that are more, much more logical. Medieval Nordic literature served mostly as a literary resource with the purpose of teaching the language and expressing it in an oral and written form, as well as forming a cognitive process that helped to keep these peoples connected to cultural elements that in themselves served as vehicles of social, cultural and religious understandings. That which was more banal, um, that which was common knowledge, was rarely written about. Just as today, certain processes and behaviors are commonplace and common knowledge. They do not need to be preserved precisely because they are common knowledge. Everybody knows, right? Uh, the same happened in ancient societies, especially in ancient societies since the resources for writing were scarcer and rarer. Only relevant knowledge was written and not what was ordinary and common. As one, uh, as one patron, one of my patrons rightly pointed out, another strong reason as to why weddings weren't that much written about is possibly due to the fact that weddings were more about legal ties and very little about romance. It's not just a question of forceful weddings between two people, which were more about alliances between families and powerful groups, but we are also talking about cases of slavery and rape which also constitute forceful ties between aggressor and victim and between slave owner and the slaves, which were seen as property, as objects, and could be exchanged and sold to be brides to create legal and political ties. Of course, not all weddings would be like this with this brutality, but as one of my patrons pointed out, they were definitely negotiable and legally binding. Stories worth remembering or mentioning were not being created in terms of weddings or marriages. Instead, most weddings were a means to an end, just another activity to increase wealth and power or for convenience. Uh, this actually reminds me of a specific point I have briefly mentioned in the video I've made about homosexuality in the Viking Age. Even though gays and lesbians in the Viking Age were allowed in certain historical periods to keep their lovers of the same sex, they still had duties to perform in relation to their families, to increase the family, to create a new generation, increase wealth and power, and so on and so forth. So homosexuality was allowed to a certain extent because people were still expected forced, most likely, to wed or create an alliance through wedding ceremony with someone of the opposite sex to generate family and keep property, expand property and to receive and exchange gifts. Whatever people did in their private life and the lovers they kept, they were still expected to perform the duty of generating children. That's mostly what it was all about. We are talking about the Viking Age, which is precisely a moment in Scandinavian history of a rapid economic, military and political change, a hunger for power, acquiring lands, property, increasing wealth. So we are dealing with a mentality far closer to that of a gang or mafia mentality than anything else. It's basically Game of Thrones, but romance is dead and somehow there's a troll involved. So, how to conduct a wedding during the Viking Age and the types of ceremonies held during marriage vows. Although the answer may seem easy to grasp and straightforward, the truth is that there isn't a great body of evidences concerning Viking Age weddings as said before. And what was said before, I really want you to keep that in mind because 
from there on we can only find a little glimpse into this reality of the social life of Viking Age Scandinavians. But there are some literary sources, as I've said. If we look into the sagas, uh, which is indeed the greatest amount of literary sources we have on medieval Nordic societies, there isn't a great focus on the love and intimate life of Scandinavians of the period, aside from the myth of Thor, <laughs> becoming the bride of the giant Frimur, which expresses religious concepts little to do with actual marriage. Something I would definitely like to talk about in the future. But indeed, uh, that particular account, one of the most famous weddings in Norse myths, uh, aside from the one, of course, of Njordr and Skadi, which also conveys a message that has little to do with wedding ceremonies, but more with, precisely, the sacrifices of forceful marriages. Well, Thor's wedding really isn't about weddings at all. <laughs> Much of what we know concerning past Nordic marriages or weddings uh, comes from a late period and from legal codes and literary sources more reflective of medieval Scandinavia circa the year 1000 to the 1400s of the Common Era in a time period when the Nordic societies were very much Catholic. Also, much of the information concerning the Viking Age originated in Iceland, which may reflect Icelandic practices only, as there were considerable differences in laws, mythical religious aspects and the social-cultural background, generally speaking, between Iceland and Scandinavia. We must turn to the little evidences archaeology can provide, which isn't refreshing yet, <laughs> because much of the scientific work on human sciences concerning past civilizations has been rather male-focused or male-centric, and only in the past decade or so there's been an increase on women's studies and their role in ancient societies. So there's yet a body of evidences we must wait for as such studies develop. We just have to remember the case of uh, Viking Age warrior women in burial contexts who have been regarded as men for the past 100 years since their discovery. And even though recent studies present, without a shadow of a doubt, that such contexts present female osteological remains, the studies still aren't well accepted by some within academia, which, as you, can, as you might imagine, delays the scientific research, unfortunately. This being said, the information is still coming through and I believe we shall know more about this and other subjects in the near future. Hopefully. I keep my hopes high. I also take the opportunity to say that the act of hand fasting is quite popular and common to see in neo-pagan weddings, mostly Wiccan, which leads many to believe this was a common practice among ancient pagans as well, and therefore Viking Age heathens would at least perform this when saying their wedding vows. Hand fasting became a common performance by the 13th century of the Common Era as a practice in unofficiated weddings, uh, betrothal, 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 what the hell is wrong with me today? As I was saying, in officiated, unofficiated weddings, a betrothal, or for a temporary marriage commitment. This has been revived in neo-paganism for the unofficial marriages in terms of not having an official registration of marriage according to the religions of the state and or as second marriage ceremonies before or after the official marriage. As much information as archaeology can provide, the contexts are always static and present neither a concrete way of thinking of the period, nor a moving action, so a wedding ceremony per se is not possible to determine. As said before, much of what we know concerning Viking Age and Nordic medieval weddings is in relation to the law, marriage negotiations, references to couples, sexuality, courtship, duties and rights, but little on the ceremony itself. The reason for not having been described in detail how a wedding ceremony was performed or conducted is the same reason why we nowadays have no need to have a wedding ceremony explained to us in detail, because we have either went to one or have heard about it from someone else, meaning it was common practice and there was no need to thoroughly record 
common knowledge or common practice because marriages were less of a religious cult performance. We also have to take in mind that Viking Age societies did not have a fixed or official priesthood, so the religious sphere wasn't thoroughly recorded. Heathen temples existed. The great majority of them, if not all, were ordered to be constructed by a local wealthy lord or landowner, as the elite often held the religious ceremonies and cultic performances. As such, the religious conduct in temples was very much controlled by the elite, so any wedding ceremonies that may have been performed in heathen temples of the Viking Age were certainly controlled and conducted by the elite. As, as such, the elite held the knowledge of the performances. They controlled the religion to control the masses. So even the performance and ceremony itself may not have been actually common knowledge to the general public. This may be yet another reason. Concerning religious ceremonies and cultic behavior, we have little information, but we do find artifacts, some sort of material culture, which in the case of pre-Christian civilizations, it's almost always impossible to separate religion from magic. Certain religious practices and cultic performances have been recorded, though often cryptic as it is seen in poetry and myth, but it always contains a cultural code that facilitates remembering such religious and cultic performances in oral form through easy associations, parallels and similarities between words, terms, characters and events. Let's not forget that much of what we know concerning the late Viking Age and medieval Nordic marriages comes from Iceland, and preserved written accounts with details about such societies were written by Icelandic Christians, as before that much of the written evidences during pre-Christian Scandinavia uh, comes in the form of runes in material culture that mostly had an apotropaic purpose or as memorial messages. And the case of rune stones are in their great majority with a funerary purpose to remember or to honor the dead, sometimes with references to particular myths and sometimes simple phrases in reference to the deceased, uh, the person that paid for the monument and the author of the inscription. The great majority of Scandinavian rune stones were raised in the 11th century, already Catholic period, and it wasn't a common practice in Iceland. In fact, there are no rune stones in Iceland, aside from the very few ones created and raised already by the 19th century. Before Christian written sources, much of the knowledge of the daily life of Nordic peoples was preserved in oral tradition. So, in the case of marriages, it would be very much the same. Knowledge probably restricted to the Gothi or Ithia, the priest or priestess. The English language really isn't the best to find a proper term to designate pre-Christian religious authorities. Well, much of this knowledge has been probably restricted or preserved orally and transmitted orally between the priestly figures who in the case of pre-Christian Nordic societies, were people whose main functions in society were not being full-time priests or priestesses, but a role occasionally held by members of the nobility, the elite, who held specific religious ceremonies to their subjects during specific times, mostly in public ceremonies of a fertility religious character. Such oral knowledge concerning various public and private religious ceremonies and cultic behaviors would be kept sacred by maintaining such knowledge a secret, limiting information to the general public to keep the right of the nobility over the rituals to control religion, and such knowledge only being passed on orally to the initiates of their cults. So there's actually a failure on the elaboration of ceremonies and rituals, not just concerning weddings, but also concerning other ceremonies, of course. However, we know more about public sacrifices because it involved a great portion of the population, including people from different localities and even districts or regions who would purposely travel to attend certain public ceremonies. 
And there would also be merchants and foreigners, travelers. Certain contemporary literary evidences have been provided by Arabic travelers and German chroniclers, such as Ahmed ibn Fadlan and Adam of Bremen. A wedding ceremony, on the other hand, would be something more private, quite restricted to the families involved and most likely with the presence of a chieftain or, at the very least, a jarl, who, along his wife or not, would play the role of priest and priestess, holding the religious power as well as the social, economic and military power. There's a certain parallel here, more or less, with the celebration Alpha Blot, which we know close to nothing about it, precisely because it was a private sacrifice and quite regional, actually. But by the name, we have the perception that it was a sacrifice held towards the Olfar, the elves, be those land spirits or ancestors and probably something connected to fertility. As we understand in the written sources, the character of the ancestors as elves that became elves often provide fertility from their burial mounds, right? But with the lack of a proper name for a wedding, there's even fewer ideas we can come up with, sadly. But concerning a religious authority in pre-Christian Viking Age weddings, it's just speculation, actually. A ceremony of a more intimate and private character may have been common knowledge in certain aspects, but in many others it would have had some personalized aspects only related to the family of each of the individuals about to come together as husband and wife. Also, we must take into consideration that most of the written sources, especially the sagas uh, that deal with the human society, by the time they were written, Christianity had replaced many of the older pagan practices. This means that Christianity has had, obviously, a considerable influence over the pagan practices and deliberately put an end to any associations to pagan deities. Thus, any pagan deity related to wedding, love, courtship, sexuality and fertility was no longer present in wedding ceremonies. And Christianity itself has had a great impact over ancient temples, places of worship and material culture. In fact, it is quite possible that some of the old Norse gods that may have been evoked in a wedding ceremony were turned into Christian saints, and it's quite difficult to understand where does paganism end and Christianity begins. It's very, it's very well merged together. We know that the traditional day for weddings in the north was Friday, sacred to the goddess Friga, or Frigg, so perhaps the goddess would have some important ritual role within the ceremony itself, but which one? Certainly she would have been evoked at the very least, but how? <laughs> we also know that Thor was called upon during a wedding ceremony, but how? What material culture was used? Which words were said? Was there a particular mythological account portrayed during the ceremony? Were there other gods evoked? Perhaps a particular reenactment of a myth concerning fertility? We do not know. These are questions you often ask. These are questions I often ask, which leads me to do research. But sadly, there's little we can really come up with. However, marriages were less religious, as I said, because they were common practice. And even though we may see it from a modern perspective and marriages in the Western world, at least, often conduced within a sacred space and the performance held by a priestly figure, in most ancient civilizations and societies, uh, marriages were ne negotiations between families. As Christy Ward, um, the Viking answer lady puts it, the main function and reason for marriages would serve to control sexual activity and reproduction, and as a means of forming socio-economic alliances between social groups. So we have more about stories of couples, laws concerning marriage, duties and rights of the couples and each individual within the relationship, negotiation or negotiating a marriage alliance, but little concerning the wedding ceremony itself. 
By the way, um, Christy Ward, the Viking Answer Lady, is one of the very, very, very few blogs or websites concerning Viking Age history and studies that I really find to be extremely reliable and was, was one of the main sources I have recently discovered and used to help me in the research of this video, at least. If we take into consideration that a marriage can be defined as a rite of passage, perhaps we can construct a neo-pagan marriage based on key common elements of rites of passage. A rite of passage is a marked ceremony or ritual in which the persons involved initiate uh, abandon their former identity, social status, and quite often even detach themselves from the family, community, or other larger social groups and become independent individuals or form new small groups, forming their own family nucleus and or, after the rite of passage itself, being reintegrated in the same social group or, in the case of marriage, being integrated in a larger group unifying communities. And this is the more likely scenario for pre-Christian Viking Age weddings or pre-Christian Nordic weddings in general of none finno ugric indigenous peoples at least. The myth of Njordr and Skadi wedding in part uh, really demonstrates the frustration of arranged marriages between people that do not love each other and sacrifices are made and the struggles of leaving behind one's own home, family and familiar and intimate environments. In this way I think a new construction, a new construction may be created indeed. Not an historically accurate reconstruction, because of which we know close to nothing, but at least an entire ceremony based on pagan, pagan elements of rites of passage to create a ceremony that doesn't resemble a non-pagan ceremony in any aspect as best as possible. Also, since many of ancient pagan sacrifices and rituals often also had the reenactment of a particular mythological account to reinforce the intention of the ritual and the evocation of the forces that are wanted. Perhaps we may look at certain myths concerning fertility deities and try to reenact such myths as a form of evoking the particular blessings and spirit energy, as it were, that seem appropriate in a wedding or, in, in other words, in the union of two, two individuals. As an example, we often see in certain shamanic communities the spiritual leader, the shaman, taking on the role of a particular deity of fertility, often of the opposite gender identity of that of the spiritual leader, incorporating the deity or spirit in question, being possessed by the deity as a symbolic act of becoming the entity itself to express the fertility powers of said deity unto the community. Or the case of ritual orgies, as another example, often being sexual performances to reenact the powers of fertility present in myths of creation, to express such fertility powers and powers of creation and creating life, concentrating such powers within the act of orgy to spread such spiritual powers and energy unto the community and the very sacred space on which the ritual orgy is performed to fertilize the fields, but also to bring fertility into the human community and the natural space of existence from which the human community produces means of sustenance. So, it would not have been surprising that a pagan wedding would have some sort of reenactment of a particular myth of creation related to fertility and the very powers of creation, giving life, producing life, to propitiate such powers and concentrate them within the community and passing them to the individuals being joined together in ceremony, in sacred ceremony. Anyway, uh, I've mentioned before Christy Ward of the, um, the, the Viking Answer Lady website, which I consider to be one of the very, 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 very few reliable sources in terms of websites uh, concerning Viking Age history. She has written about Viking Age weddings and other related subjects, and I'll leave the link to it right at the description of this video, so you may check it for yourselves. Uh, you may check more of it for yourself. 
she offers uh, a good possible um, construction for a Viking Age wedding ceremony based on literary evidences concerning the roles of women in the Viking Age society, as well as the role of a woman when she becomes uh, a wife, and the case of rite of passage from maiden to bride. It includes good possible rituals for both the bride and the groom based on literary evidences concerning myths, folklore, and the relationship between humans and the physical spaces inhabited by non-human entities such as the grave mound, the burial mound, as well as other public spaces and structures of great relevance within the Viking Age society. All from the perspective of a wedding being understood as a rite of passage, of course. When we don't have, we make do. It's perfectly natural and normal to incorporate several elements into a performance we find to be meaningful to us, or we want to give it a specific meaning and perform it towards a particular desire, so we adapt, overcome and evolve. That's human nature. <laughs> to finalize this video, <laughs> There are, however, little golden amulets that may indicate a type of formal dancing in occasions of courtship and marriage, but also a way of recording a union between two people. I'm specifically, specifically <laughs> talking about golden amulets, Gulguba, from Denmark and other places in Scandinavia, with dancing images or what seems to be dancing sometimes, but it also shows couples, among other things. These are small rectangles of gold foil which date from the migration period to the Viking Age. Perhaps on another video I should address this type of material culture. Suffice it to say for now, Guldguber are art objects, amulets or offerings found in Scandinavia, the great majority of them found in Denmark and dating to the Nordic Iron Age. I'm applying here Nordic Iron Age as a general term to situate this on a time frame for a better understanding. To be more, more specific, um, date to the late Iron Age from the end of the Migration Age to the early Viking Age, particularly what is referred to in Norway as the Merovingian era, in Sweden as the Vandal era, we are talking about periods just before the so-called Viking Age, which is just the culmination of the Nordic Iron Age. But it can be hard to date these objects because they are often found in contexts that do not present other means to establish a proper date. Um, there are, of course, many depictions of many things in these objects, but I would like to address here the ones which represent human figures for now. Uh, what seems to be couples, at least, figures which are usually of a man and a woman facing each other, sometimes embracing. They seem to wear elaborate clothes and their knees may be bent or tied, which leads us to conclude they are probably taking part in, the form, in a formal dance, perhaps. Since dance has always been an important part of wedding festivities, indeed these amulets may be wedding amulets or love tokens. We know that during the wedding feast, after this ceremony at least, feasting and merriment would commence, that would last throughout the remainder of the week. Dancing, wrestling and other activities provided entertainment for the guests. There aren't many depictions of dancing, but we know that there was dancing as it is referred to in some sources, literary sources, concerning wedding feasts, as well as probably archaeological evidences of small amulets I've, I've talked about here, or love tokens depicting dancing couples. There exists a considerable number of these Guldguber plagues which depict a couple which seems to be in very friendly situations, intimate as in getting together in what seems a formal performance. It is to be mentioned, however, that these are frequently assumed to be deities of fertility and so they were used by couples as jewelry, precisely as amulets to bless the wedding ceremony and to give that extra divine blessing of fertility for what's to come next. However, some of these findings depict same-sex couples embracing two men embracing each other, as well as two women embracing one another. So indeed, we could also be in the presence and 
it seems to be far more likely the representation of real human couples joining together, including gay and lesbian couples of the Scandinavian Iron Age, since these plagues in general are associated with weddings and sexual union. And this is actually one very good example of commemorating homosexual relationships in the Nordic Iron Age. Just before the late Iron Age, Viking Age, when couples start to have certain responsibilities and duties to perform according to the military, economic and political struggles of the age, until, of course, homosexuality was forbidden with Christianity, sadly. The great majority of these Gulguba, over 2,000 actually, were found at the settlement of Sortmud on the Danish island of Bornholm, and these actually constitute the great majority of the findings of these specific artifacts. These have been frequently found in connection with buildings that are often interpreted as structures of worship, so it isn't likely that couples would take these amulets, these objects, with them, but this was instead a form of registration of couples that would join together in these specific sacred buildings as these amulets were thrown in there, left in there. If it were the representation of fertility deities to be worn in specific special occasions only, I don't think these great many artifacts would be necessary or have, had been made. In the island of Bornholm, Bornholm sorry, uh, in Denmark, it's almost 2,500 of these, so we are probably in the presence of a special chosen place by wealthy couples to get married, and the representation of the couple was made for the specific couple getting married in there. Uh, let's get married on that fancy island and then we spend the honeymoon over there. They even make personalized pictures of us, which we can leave it at the temple so our union can be blessed forever. Something like that. Instead of uh, an exchange of rings, we may be in the presence of a um, personalized amulet of the couple to be blessed and joined within the sacred space. Since there are other Guldguba that represent animals and other entities and whites, they were most likely souvenirs given to travelers as well. Some of them uh, seem to be representations of the dead as well, most likely to be given to the dead and as religious objects. Because the idea of going into the Vatican <laughs> or any other sacred religious place or places and bring back souvenirs or items that are considered blessed or the finger bone of a saint or whatever, these objects and these wishes from the part of religious people isn't something new and certainly not something exclusive of Christianity and other more recent religions in the history of humankind. These Guldguba seem to have re represented such objects, religious objects, which some people would take with them and others would leave it in the sacred house of worship. Given the fact that the great majority of these artifacts were found in the Danish island of Bornholm, on a very, very specific settlement, we may be in the presence of an important religious place or center of religious center, which several different people would go on religious travels, pilgrimages, uh, to see and be at this sacred place. A place so sacred that many people would probably also choose to get married there and have personified images of their union balked to be blessed and remain blessed within the sacred place. It's not just Christians that make a lot of money with religion. In fact, these are golden plagues, so this must have been a very rich settlement, probably thanks to religion. So, that's it, my dear friends. I hope this video has given you some light on the subject. In terms of literature, several Icelandic sagas mention marriages indeed, but without details. Quick scenes or situations involving marriages are also cited by Saxo Grammaticos and in mythological sources as well, but these sources are not acceptable as credible or reliable sources, nor do they present a um, historical ritual, in terms of weddings, of course. In terms of archaeology, it is what you have seen in this video and hopefully it may have given you some ideas and inspiration. Now, all those who are about to get married or have been recently married, in whichever way you have chosen to conduct the wedding and in whatever personal, religious, spiritual or none at all personal beliefs you have, I wish upon you many blessings, lots of luck, 
strength of mind and spirit, and may the flame of passion and love never be extinguished. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, tá fora Thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Farewell, my dear friends.